Hello, class. Welcome to a Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me today. Did you know the Massachusetts Bay Colony banished and even executed some who practiced their faith differently than the ruling clergy? Roger Williams, the founder of the Rhode Island Colony, was initially so exclusive with his faith, he banned everyone from his church except for himself. Anne Hutchinson had become so popular that she had upwards of 100 people gathering to hear from her, a woman in the 1630s. Lastly, our ideas of freedom of religion, the foundation of the free exercise and establishment clauses in our Constitution, were far, far different than ideas of religious freedom during the early 17th century. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will learn about that and more in episode 11, Puritans in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, part two. What's up, everyone? Welcome to class. To catch everyone up, I want to briefly provide context for our lesson today. Last episode, we covered the landing of the Puritans at Massachusetts Bay in 1630 and the beginnings of the colony. Today, we are going to continue to discuss the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but focus specifically on the role religion played in their society and government. By doing this, we'll be talking in more detail about two very well-known religious dissenters, Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson. Although not derived from economic tensions, this struggle to maintain the church's primacy in the Massachusetts Bay Colony was extremely important, and it is no more clearly seen than in the conflicts with Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson. But before we get into that, let's discuss the broader role of religion in Massachusetts Bay. During this time, many Puritans were asking themselves, what is the true nature of God and Christianity and people's relation to their faith? The debate at this time was a difficult one for those in Europe, and this caused, like we've mentioned, many people to move to the New World. Now, much of the Puritan faith was really anchored in this belief in deference to authority. Even sometimes they would reference the fifth commandment. And you can see that they thought of their Puritan societies in a paternal way. Now, Puritans were an offshoot of Calvinism, and they believe that salvation can come only through the Bible. This is a far more decentralized version of religion. And what it's going to do is it's going to empower the individual, which, of course, those in power are not going to want to be doing. Calvinism is this belief that God is held above everyone else, and that includes the king, church officials, civil rule, and civil authority. So, as you can imagine, believing in this alone is somewhat revolutionary and controversial. Now, Calvinism also had a, another more interesting characteristic, the idea of predestination. Calvinists believed that God had already determined whether or not you were going to have salvation or not. People that were, were considered the, quote, elect. They were called visible saints. And of course, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to live your life not knowing whether or not you're going to be saved, constantly looking for that sign from God. Now, whenever I teach about Calvinism, the first question I always get is, well, Mr. Caldwell, if they're predetermined whether or not they're going to heaven or hell, then right, what's the motivation for living a moral life? What's the motivation for being kind to others? And the thing is, is that many of these Calvinists, they didn't know if they were going to heaven or hell. And even if they believed that they had gotten a sign from God that they were going to be saved, they still constantly looked for other signs to reaffirm this idea. So they were living every day trying to see a sign from God. And they were thinking with every action they had whether or not it was going to bring them closer or further away from that. 
constant re-examination of their daily actions. Now, the two people we're going to be discussing in detail today, Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson, they were far more separatist than most of the Puritan community at Massachusetts Bay. Now, remember, there were many other separatists just like them throughout New England. In Salem, they were such separatists that they actually cut the cross of St. George out of their flag because the flag was awarded to the English king by the pope. And the separatists wanted nothing to do with Catholicism, right? This is a pretty drastic move. So Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson weren't alone in New England, but they certainly felt alone at times in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Roger Williams, born in 1603, most likely in London, studied divinity at Cambridge. As you know, John Winthrop and the Puritans did not want to abandon the Church of England, right? But instead, they just wanted to purify it. Well, Williams was different. He was one of those separatists, just like the pilgrims and just like those in Salem. When Roger Williams came over to New England, it was a big deal. He was well-known, and many people were excited for his arrival. When Williams arrived and was offered the position of teacher-minister in Boston— He refused because the church would not separate from the Church of New England. In addition, Williams had an issue with the fact that civil magistrates were punishing people for violating the Ten Commandments. Williams planned to head to Salem, but Boston pressured Salem and they withdrew their offer. In 1631, Williams headed to Plymouth, but once again didn't quite get along with everyone as well as he had hoped. Williams had a couple different controversial views. Aside from his view of religion, Williams' view of land ownership was just as radical. He often challenged colonists during disputes over land ownership, asking them who gave them the right to own the land, often supporting the idea that the Native Americans had just as much of a claim to the land as they did. Now, over time, Williams quieted down about this belief in land ownership, but this tells us something about him. He's not afraid to back down from the accepted thought in the area, and he seems to be a pretty open-minded and accepting person. But like I said, the dispute over land ownership isn't what Roger Williams is known for. He's known for his view on the role of religion in society. And there is a pretty powerful quote from Roger Williams about his view on the intermixing of church and state. He says, the intermixing of church and state is, quote, the garden and spouse of Christ, a filthy dunghill and whorehouse of rotten and stinking whores and hypocrites. Pretty powerful stuff. Throughout his time in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and other surrounding areas, he continued to take public issue with how intricately involved he believed the state was with the church. This led to his exile in 1635, after being convicted of heresy and sedition, sending him to Narragansett country, eventually establishing Providence, Rhode Island. After his exile, and more boggling to Puritan sensibilities than his views of land ownership, were his views on the right to receive communion. Williams waffled back and forth on who exactly had the right to receive communion. Who is worthy of this body of Christ? Williams believed that if you were not in fact saved by God, then you shouldn't receive communion. Over time, Williams became more exclusive, telling people that if they were sinners, they certainly were not going to be receiving communion from him or his church. Eventually, believe it or not, Roger Williams and his wife Mary were the only two people that he deemed worthy of communion. Unsurprisingly, Roger Williams then had concerns about Mary. So then he was the only one left. It was at this point he realized, hold on a second, I am also a sinner. This revelation, of course, impacted him personally and brought him to the recognition that everyone, in fact, was a sinner. Communion was not to be given to people who rejected sin, but in fact, Williams realized it was given to people to inspire them to reject sin. So instead of making it exclusive, he did a total 180 and made it extremely inclusive, 
welcoming anyone to take communion, which in some ways was far more controversial. This newfound inclusivity made Providence a destination for many, welcoming any faiths and sinners. This approach will also lead to trading success with the local natives, whom Roger Williams and members of Providence, Rhode Island, treated quite well. In the Charter for Rhode Island, King Charles II says about Rhode Island, quote, No person within the said colony of Rhode Island at any time hereafter shall be any wise, molested, punished, disquieted, or called in question for any differences in opinion over matters of religion and do not actually disturb the civil peace of our colony, but that all and every person and persons may, from time to time and in times hereafter, freely and fully have and enjoy his and their own judgments and consciences in matters of religious concernment throughout the tract of land hereafter mentioned, they behaving themselves peacefully and quietly. So you can see in the Charter for Rhode Island, Charles II says, freedom of religion for all, as long as you believe in your faith peacefully and quietly, it will be allowed. Pretty huge success for Roger Williams, if you ask me. But Roger Williams wasn't the only religious dissenter of New England to make waves during this time. Anne Hutchinson was a rabble-rouser in her own right, and we'll talk in more detail about her experiences in just a second. Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know that if you would like to raise your hand and participate, please feel free to reach out. You can find us on Twitter with the handle at A Teacher's Hist and on Facebook at A Teacher's History Podcast. In order for as many people as possible to learn more about the history of the United States, please consider leaving a review on iTunes and subscribing to the show. By subscribing, you can get episodes automatically downloaded to your device. Anne Hutchinson, born in 1591, traveled to New England in 1634, following a minister named John Cotton, whom introduced the idea of absolute grace to Hutchinson. When she arrived in New England, she was disappointed to find out that John Cotton was relegated to a subordinate role within the Church of Massachusetts Bay. This naturally made her question the judgment of those running the church in the area. In fact, Hutchinson would disrupt or even leave the congregation when other pastors such as John Wilson would preach. In her free time, Hutchinson was a midwife and she was probably a pretty good one because she had like 15 kids. And while working as a midwife, she would often have conversations with women regarding scripture or sermons. Eventually, women and men began flocking to Hutchinson's home, seeking her interpretation of the sermons. At one point, she had upwards of 100 people gathering for these conventicles, which is a fancy word for an unofficial religious meeting of lay people. Hutchinson's message of absolute grace stressed the importance of the relationship between an individual and God, thus, of course, cutting the church out of the equation, limiting the works of the church and the church leadership. While her impact may seem benign, we have to recognize just how much of a social threat she was at this time. Hutchinson was eventually accused of antinomianism, which is the idea that because of God's grace, Christians should not be so strictly held to unbending moral principles of the church. Many of the principles of morality were far too strict and unreasonable, according to Hutchinson. Now, people began to wonder, you know, hold on a second, if you can get salvation through grace, then why would you have to follow doctrine and teachings of the church leaders so closely? But the tenets of Puritanism in the late 17th century did not harmonize with the introduction of logic. In the end, the danger is that if you begin to question the Church of New England, then you can question the greater Church of England, or even the authority of the king. These are the types of questions that greatly worried church leaders in New England, and, I mean, for good reason. Once John Winthrop publicly opposed her, Hutchinson's days in the Massachusetts Bay Colony were numbered. In 1637, Hutchinson was tried for heresy. John Winthrop presided over the civil trial. The central issue of the trial 
was who or what gave her the authority to preach her message. In the end of the second day of the trial, after parrying off numerous accusations and seeming to really hold her own, she proclaimed the following, quote, You have no power over my body, neither can you do me any harm, for I am in the hands of the eternal Jehovah my Savior. I am at his appointment, the bounds of my habitation are cast in heaven, no further do I esteem of any mortal man than creatures in his hand. I fear none but the great Jehovah, which hath foretold me of these things, and I do verily believe that he will deliver me out of our hands. And this is where it gets really interesting. She says, Therefore, take heed how you proceed against me, for I know that, for this you go about to do to me, God will ruin you and your posterity and this whole state. No one is quite sure why exactly Hutchinson said this, but it was the nail in her coffin. In trying to teach the court the truth of absolute grace, the court convicted her and condemned her as, quote, being a woman not fit for our society. Eventually, after also being convicted in another trial, this time a church trial, Hutchinson was sent into exile and upon the urging of Roger Williams, moved to Rhode Island, establishing Portsmouth. In 1642, Hutchinson left Portsmouth after her husband died, traveling west to New York, and was unfortunately later killed in a Native American attack in 1643. Hutchinson and Williams are controversial on their own, but one thing that made Hutchinson even more difficult to swallow for church leadership in the Massachusetts Bay Colony was the fact that she was a woman. Being a woman, she could be viewed as far more radical and threatening to the power structure than what she was actually communicating. Potentially, her conviction could have been more of an issue over not what she was saying, but who had the authority to say it. And one thing we need to consider when we talk about freedom of religion during this time is that when you think about the writing of the Constitution and the Establishment Clause and Free Exercise Clause in the First Amendment, we often have a tendency to apply these early ideas of freedom of religion to these founding fathers. But the gap in time between Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson and the writing of the Constitution is the same amount of time between the Civil War and today. And this reminds us that ideas are not frozen in amber. They're not frozen in time. But there's a dynamic genesis that occurs over time. And this issue was not about keeping religion out of government, like we think of freedom of religion today, but about keeping government out of religion. People were afraid the government would interfere with their godly pursuits of salvation. And this, of course, is the chief thesis of Roger Williams. This is the inverse of the Jeffersonian notion of religious liberty and shows that this passage of time underscores the fundamental shift in ideology that occurs, even though they're working from the same basic framework of ideas. This is an almost backwards view of freedom of religion and a very anachronistic one at that. An anachronism is when you make a chronological error. When a person, an object, or event is assigned to a date or time period other than the correct one, especially when we're talking about people or things that belong to an earlier time. We have a tendency to do this throughout American history, and I'm going to try and point it out as much as I can throughout the course of this podcast. And that's where we're going to leave off today in our story of the history of the United States. The Massachusetts Bay Colony has grown significantly, experiencing mild success in trade and economics in its early years. But with this success will come growing tension between the roles of business and the role of the church within the colony. See, Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson exposed the unbending role of church leadership in Massachusetts Bay society and that is going to rear its ugly head again in the future. Thanks for listening. 
And hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. Join me next episode as I will be giving another lesson, this time on the other European nation inhabiting North America in this region, the French. I'll also be covering the Iroquois Confederacy, the Dutch who settled in New Netherland, and the Swedish colony of Delaware. Yes, you heard me right, the Swedish colony of Delaware. See you then.